Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hey, so like, what's the deal? Did I like, there's a lot of green today. What's going on? I'm Italian. I don't know what's going on today. Just kidding. Yeah, good. Y'all look, y'all look great today. Hey, uh, as Pastor Ryan said, and I'm going to say just, uh, just a little bit more about this, not because he didn't say it good, just because it's, it's that important that we keep talking about this. Easter is two weeks away. Who are you going to invite to come to church with you? You know, there's a lot of research done in the church world, extensive research. You know the number one reason why people don't go to church on Easter Sunday? Nobody asks them. That one's on us. I don't say that out of guilt. I don't say that out of shame. I say that out of inspiration and hope. I love what, I love what Pastor Ryan said. Let God do the God stuff. How about we just show up and ask and see what could happen. Easter's the time when people are looking to be in church. We're gonna talk about the resurrection. I'm gonna talk about the gospel. We're gonna give people a chance to respond to the gospel. Who, who are you gonna invite to come with? Who are you gonna ask to join you on Easter Sunday here at Northway? One more quick thing before I, I jump in. I wanna show you this. Um, Carl and Bonnie Adler, great friends of mine, um, people that I love dearly, sent me a text. They had a meal moment. They gathered people around their table, and that is them. Well done, Carl and Bonnie. They got to share with me a little bit of the story of what went on. It was a, it's a tremendous story. And when we have more time, possibly even on video, we'll share with you an extended version of the story. But, but here's what happened. They, they invited some people over. They pushed through like the idea of what are we going to serve? And it's on and then it's off and then it's on. And all, the, all those things that happen when you're making plans with people. And they had, they had the gathering and get this, they hung out at that table for five and a half hours. Woo! It's awesome. Yeah, and, and I just say that because um, like that'll happen if, if we make the ask. If we gather people around a table, they made new friends. They deepen friendships. And here's, here's the cool thing. Carl and Bonnie are, are like amazing followers of Jesus that I look up to. And they've had tons and tons and tons of experiences where God has stretched their faith. I know them, right? They have a big view of a big God. Well, that view got even bigger after this meal moment. God wants to give us experiences with him. He wants to stretch our hearts and our minds about how good he really is. Meal moments will do that. They'll bring people into our lives. They'll help us develop even richer friendships and they'll stretch our view of God and his goodness and his bigness. So here's what we're asking in this Around the Table series in the month of March or April or May. Take the challenge. Gather people around your table. Deepen some friendships. Do it in the name of Jesus and watch God show you who he is. Again, all we got to do is take a step. Now, if you're like me, if you're a bit skeptic in your heart, because I am one, it takes one to maybe know one or a few, you might be thinking like, boy, Dave, this sounds an awful lot like a church growth strategy. It is. I'm never going to be embarrassed to say, I want our church to grow. Everyone will spend forever somewhere. Everyone. I took some time. I looked up the word forever in the Greek, in the Hebrew. I looked it up in the Irish for all of you wearing green today. <laughs> forever means forever. And that means either with God in heaven or apart from God. And we call that place hell. Everyone will spend forever somewhere. So yeah, I'm not ashamed to say we got a church growth strategy. We're supposed to grow. God has given us, Jesus died to give us the, the right and the role in the name of ambassadors for Christ, the ministry of reconciliation, the idea of building bridges with people who are far from God, of grabbing our oar and rowing back to people so they can become closer to us, so they can get out of the water and get in our boats with us. If you remember what we talked about at the beginning of the year. So I will never be ashamed with saying like, I want this place to grow because it's not about Northway. It's about God's kingdom. Yeah. Who are you inviting? When are you going to have a mealtime around your table? Okay, here we go. Table series, Around the Table. And, and here's what I want to do today, just something just a little bit different. We're going to read, I'm going to read for us Psalm 23. This is our passage of scripture that we're going to dive into today as we study Jesus and meals around the table. And here's what I'm going to ask. If you're able and if you're willing, would you just stand with me for the reading of God's word? I love to do this because it changes things up just a bit. And changing our posture 
sometimes opens our heart to hear differently. Here's what Psalm 23 writes, and this is David writing. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, even though I walk through what feels like the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for my good shepherd is with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup, it overflows. Surely, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Before you sit down, turn to somebody and say hello. Tell them good morning. Put a smile on your face today. It's going to be good. Hey, so you might be wondering, okay, so Dave, this, this doesn't jive. This doesn't feel like it connects. We've been looking about Jesus and his meal moments around the table. So primarily we've been in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospels, the accounts, the personal eyewitness testimonies, the, the interviews about Jesus and his life and, and how much he spent time, how often he spent time around the table having meals with people. And today we jumped into Psalm 23. And, and, and if you don't know this, this is what's called a messianic psalm. It's a prophecy. David wrote this 3,000 years ago to help us understand who Jesus would be like and how he would interact with us. He's our good shepherd and we're his sheep. And Psalm 23 is a beautiful passage of scripture that helps us understand just how good the good shepherd is. So I'm sure you heard the meal moment. He prepares a table before us in the presence or near our enemies. Like we, we gotta get this picture of Jesus. He like lays out a full course meal for us near our enemies. And when I think about Jesus, he spares no expense. I mean, God didn't spare any expense. He gave his son to die for us. So why would I think that this is a boxed lunch kind of meal? I had those when I played baseball in college. We went on the road and it was a boxed lunch. And I was thankful, but I wasn't, I wasn't really thankful. <laughs> but when I think about Jesus and I think about this meal, I think, oh man, if you love steak, there's steak on the menu. 135 degrees, perfect pink, edge to edge. It's, it's amazing. If you love shrimp, there's shrimp on the menu. If you love pasta, the sauce is amazing. It's cooked to perfect al dente perfection that you like. If you, if you love bread, man, the bread is crusty on the outside, but warm on the inside. And when you slice it, man, that warmth melts the butter. I'm not eating carbs right now and I can taste it right now. <laughs> That's the kind of meal Jesus prepares for us because he's a good God. And he not only prepares this kind of meal for us that's, that's amazing and satisfying and perfect, but it's also done with our enemies nearby. Did y'all notice the red chair back there? That chair's not red for Valentine's Day. Our good shepherd prepares us a full course meal, a table, so that even though in the shadow of death, that valley, when our enemy is near and we can see him, we can sit down and eat and relax because the good shepherd's got our enemy at bay and we don't have to worry. We can have peace. It's a steel waters kind of meal. The one that allows you to rest, the one that allows you to feel the good kind of full without being too full, the one that you're deeply thankful for and you want more of, He's our good shepherd. And he prepares a meal for us while our enemies are near. It's almost like they have to be the ones tormented, not us. The enemy has to sit and watch us chow down while they're kept at bay. 
the MSG version of the scriptures, the message. It says it this way. You sir, thanks for getting that. I think it's funny too. Um, <laughs> Brittany, you're the best. I, I love you. Um, Eugene Peterson wrote it this way. You serve me a six course dinner in front of my enemies. Like the DJD version, Dave Joseph D'Angelo version says it like this. My good shepherd serves me New York style pizza, the floppy kind with mushrooms on it, right in the front of Duke basketball fans. Because <laughs> it's March Madness, right? Um, there, there's an author and pastor. He, he, he has a church down in Atlanta, Passion City Church, and it's a phenomenal church and they do amazing work. And, and I know people who help do that amazing work. And the heart is really to help people know and experience and follow Jesus, especially young adult generation. Louis Giglio is his name. And he wrote a book called Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table. Don't Let the Enemy Have a Seat at Your Table. And it's a book about the, the fears we experience in life because the good shepherd is talking about our now and our future in Psalm 23. And Louis, it's an awesome book. And I highly recommend this book because he helps us understand and experience victory through Jesus in the battlefield of our mind when it comes to worry and anxiety and fears of our future. And, and this is what Louis writes as he studies Psalm 23. He says, in less time than it takes to Snap your fingers. If you and I aren't careful, if, if Jesus' sheep aren't careful, the enemy can pull up a seat at the table that your shepherd has prepared for you. Meaning sometimes the enemy isn't near our table. He's actually at our table. And I love talking about the battlefield of the mind, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. I love and support counseling. We have a counseling center here today. I endorse that. I love inner healing and prayer. We're developing a prayer team called Freedom Prayer Ministry. And all those things are so, so, so important. But let's be honest. Sometimes we give the devil, the enemy, more credit than he is due. Sometimes the reason this red chair isn't back here and near our table. Sometimes the reason it is at our table is because we made the invite. Because we extended the invitation. Because we sometimes without even knowing it said, why don't you pull up a chair? And the closer he gets to our table, the louder his voice gets in our life. We don't want that red chair at our table, do we? Because scripture gives us a clear picture of who that red chair is, our enemy. The Bible tells us that his native tongue is lies. Not a little lie, not a small deception, not even just like a, a little bit, one or two degrees off of the truth, a straight up lie every tongue. It's his native tongue. As much as I speak English, and I speak English all the time, Every time the devil speaks, he opens his mouth. It's a lie. It's not true. Why, why would we want more lies at our table when in today's world, it's so hard to really know what is true? And yet we're the ones that make the invite. The devil not only tells us that, or the Bible not only tells us that the devil is a liar, it also tells us that he's an accuser of the brethren. That's found in Revelation. That, that, that's like a special one, I believe, that's directed for us, for God's sheep, the brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ. He accuses us. He uses his lies to plant thoughts of accusation, either about ourselves or about the other people who are at our physical tables in our homes. When that red chair gets closer and closer and closer, the accusations feel more real and more true. It, it sort of looks like this. As you're sitting there and, and, and as that, that chair is there at our invitation, and we'll get to that in just a few moments, the accusations sort of feel like this. Did your wife really just say that to you? She's not so good of a spouse anymore, is she? Or if you would have been a better husband and provided more, been more respectable and worthy of respect, she wouldn't have said or done that. Wives, it looks something like this. Did he really not do what, what you asked him to do? He doesn't love you. In fact, you're not, you're not worthy of being loved. It's actually your fault that he doesn't do those things. And your kids, they don't respect or listen or honor you because they're just like you. 
unworthy of it all. Come on, we all know what an accusation looks and feels like, and the louder it gets, it's because the red chair is closer than it's supposed to be. It's at, not near. The devil is a liar. He is an accuser of the brethren. Revelation tells us that. And then we also see in Scripture in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, he has an agenda. It's to destroy us. It's to devour us. I don't know if you know this, back in Job, when, but right before Job is about to be tested, uh, God asks like a question and the devil, he's like, where are you? And he said, I was roaming around the earth looking, looking for a victim. The New Testament tells us that he roams around this earth looking for someone like a roaring lion and he wants to devour them. Do you ever watch those National Geographic videos where you see a lion feasting? You want that at your table? Do I want that at my table? Psalm 23 says, the meal is near our enemy, not with our enemy. The devil is not creative, but he is persistent. He wants to destroy us. He wants to distract us. He wants to discourage us. He wants to divide us. He wants to take God's truth and his word and distort it. So we're, we're just like Adam and Eve in the, in the garden. Did God really say that? Is he really a good shepherd? Maybe you'd be a better shepherd. Maybe you should take the wheel and step in. See, I think we know that he doesn't belong here at our table. But sometimes I'm not even sure we're aware of what we might be doing to give him that invitation. I want to read something to you. This is found in 1 Corinthians 7. This is Paul giving instruction to married couples. And I want you to hear what can happen when you and I have no self-control in our lives. Don't deprive each other, sexually speaking. He's talking to husbands and wives. Except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you can devote yourselves to prayer. He's saying, come together sexually. And don't go, don't go a period of time without that. Make sure if you do choose to take a time for prayer to not come together sexually, that you come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Do you hear that? There's a direct correlation to spirit-led, God's word-aligned kind of self-control in our lives and where that red chair is in relation to our table. The Bible tells us not to give the devil any form of an opportunity, not even in some translations, a foothold in our life. And sometimes it's a lack of self-control that takes that red chair from near our table and invites it subtly to at our table. That whole idea of roaming around the earth, looking for someone to devour, put it in this terms. He's roaming around, checking his mailbox, just, just longing for an invitation to our table. So his lies can get louder. So his accusations can get more real. And so division in your marriage, in your world, in your church, with your kids can be the thing you think you should do and that you actually deserve to do. We, we don't want him at our table. And this means in order to uninvite him, we've got to be willing to step into spirit-led self-control. Again, I am all for talking about the battlefield of the mind. But sometimes there's a part we excuse ourselves from. And it's called being self-controlled. It's a battle of our wills. It's an intentional orienting of our heart in God's word so we can walk in his ways. None of us want this red chair here. The question is, is what are we willing to do about it? So for me, in my, in my studies, as I read through um, Louis Giglio's book, and as I took time to reflect on my life, I've realized um, there, are, there are things where I lack self-control, where, where I'm not as in alignment my, my will, my flesh is, is sort of out of alignment. And I'm living as if I'm the good shepherd. 
I want to share those things with you in hopes today that perhaps this will spark some things in your life that you might see an opportunity to grow in self-control. The first one is this. I lack self-control when I constantly feed my fears. Like when I, when I go to feed and, and listen to a feed that is only reinforcing the things I'm afraid of, I'm extending an invitation for the devil to sit at my table. Because when we feed our fears, we starve our faith. I'm talking about your social feed. I'm talking about a conversation feed. I'm talking about like, like the political news feed of our day. Have y'all, have y'all noticed that we don't use vision and hope to inspire people today? We don't report on what happened. All we do is we take a ton of time to say, oh man, here's what's gonna happen. Like, have, have y'all noticed, you listen to Sports Talk Radio, simple example of what this looks like. What's gonna happen with the quarterback of the Steelers? <laughs> oh my gosh, we should panic. Everything's a mess. There's nothing that you or I can do about this until the games get played in the fall. But boy, we're gonna talk about it for hours and we're gonna, we're gonna be pessimistic about it and we're gonna, we're gonna plant questions and seeds of doubt and we're gonna create chaos and discouragement and division and now we're gonna be wondering what's going on down in Pittsburgh. And that's just sports talk radio. How about in the political arena? You know, what, you know what happens come election time with our social feeds and with news feeds and with conversation feeds? Everyone is peddling in fear rather than helping feed our faith. 2024 is going to be the most important election ever. I heard that four years ago. And I heard that eight years ago. And I heard that 12 years ago. I'm doing math by adding four, so it takes me a second. <laughs> Seriously, this election is important, but God's kingdom is more important. Amen. The political arena is going to try and persuade us to be afraid. Listen, there is a point where we need to be aware of the issues in our world. I'm not saying don't be aware because awareness helps us vote. It helps us prayerfully figure out, okay, how do I vote and how do I navigate this? But sometimes there's a giant gap between being aware and being so deathly afraid. And it takes self-control to turn the feed off, to walk away from the conversation, to get social media away from your heart because a lot of times we're feeding our fears over and over and over again. And how much more do we have to know about the darkness? You already know it's dark. None of us are blind to the fact that it's dark in our world. I would rather be impressed with Jesus than more and more aware of how dark it is out there. Amen. It takes self-control though. It takes a willingness to not conform to the pattern of this world to be different and to take that red chair and just push it back and say, I'll be aware, but I'm not gonna be afraid. To turn the feet off, to walk away. So the devil doesn't just have a field day in our hearts and right here in our church too. I like self-control when I feed my fears. The second thing in my heart is I like self-control when I allow unforgiveness to keep growing in my heart. And, and, if, and if I have fears that are feeding and all of a sudden I'm letting unforgiveness start to grow and fester in my heart, it's almost like I take that invitation and I say, here, why don't you have a closer seat? It's like the effects of a total lack of self-control, they get really, really cumulatively destructive in our lives. The Bible is not giving us an option when it comes to forgiveness. It's not. Forgiveness is like an onion. Like there are layers to the situation, the offense, the mistreatment. And the deeper we get into those layers, man, the more it, it makes us cry. It does. But yet the Bible never says, hey, you just let me know if you want to forgive. It just doesn't say that. And the more unforgiveness breeds in our hearts towards anyone in our life, whether alive or not, 
the more we extend an invitation to sit closer and get louder in our ear to our enemy. That's one of the areas where we lack self-control. And, and all I'm saying is, look, if you want to grow in forgiveness, if you, want, if you want to be more and more in line with, with God's will and what his word calls us to do, Jesus died to give us that ministry of reconciliation. If you want to be more and more like Christ, I'm just saying put forgiveness on the table. It's not always right now. I think sometimes we forgive too quickly, if I can say that. We don't even know like the, the fullness of the offense, but, but if it's off the table, we're giving the devil a seat at our table. It happens at a, at a different pace for all of us. It has to be spirit led, but this is the kind of self-control God has, is calling us to. You know, Timothy tells us God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of power and of love and a, and a sound mind. Some translations take this third one and call it a spirit of self-control. The Holy Spirit will lead us on this journey of forgiveness. Listen, if you're, if you're here and you're struggling through, even orienting your heart towards the possibility of forgiveness in the future, I want you to go to our app. There's a, there's a resource under the resource tab. It's all about forgiveness. And it's a really thorough walking through of what it looks like to grow in allowing the Spirit to lead us when it comes to forgiveness because any form of unforgiveness in our hearts towards anyone is an invitation for the devil to just, to just accuse and lie and devour. I lack self-control. Me, Dave D'Angelo, when I feed my fears, when I let unforgiveness brew in my heart. The third area where I lack self-control upon reflection is when I parent my three kids, our three kids, Brooke is here in the room, when we parent our three kids as if this life is the only life. When I make sports not a secondary or a tertiary thing, when I make it a primary thing. When I obsess over their career. When where they're going to go to school or what they're going to study or what relationship status they're going to have or what crowd they're going to be in or out of, when those are the most important things, I am allowing and inviting the devil, the enemy, to my table. And if it's there with fear and if it's there with unforgiveness, guess what? It just got a little closer to the head of the table. The only priority that we are supposed to have as parents for our kids is to disciple them to know to experience and to follow Jesus. That's our goal. Anything other than that is setting them up to worship an idol. I've gotten a lot of advice in my life when it comes to parenting. Brooke and I have had like the beautiful privilege of having people in our lives who love us and who love Jesus and who are willing to speak to us. Lots and lots of advice. Two of them stick out to this day that have shaped our hearts and our tears and our strategy sessions, and our apologies as well. The, the first one is a, a friend and a, and a trusted guy that I love and is a spiritual mentor. His name is Joe. Um, he told us, look, look, when you're a parent, your only job is to prepare your kids so that they'll respond with a yes the moment Jesus calls their name. To know, to experience, and to follow him. Anything other than that goal that you resource that you prioritize, that you obsess over, that you're afraid of happening or not happening, is teaching them to worship something other than Jesus. It's passing on a form of idolatry to them. Mom and dad, our primary goal is to know that this life isn't the only life. And forever means eternity. Whether our kids know and experience and follow Jesus is more important than if they get into Harvard or make it to the NFL or have so much money that, man, we can have six houses, not one house. Because forever is a long time. Second piece of advice that, that we got as parents, it actually came from um, our doctor, um, we, have, we have three kids, Nico, Gino, and Mila, the junior mafia. That's right. I love calling them that. Um, I love when people say, so are you Italian? Yeah. Yep. 
just a little bit. Um, when we had our, our oldest son, like the first six weeks, I think we were back and forth at our doctor's office. <laughs> Honey, like 12 times. I don't know. There was, there was one point, Nico, um, I mean, six weeks old, he had a rash and we were like, it's the measles, it's the mumps. Something's going on here. I don't know. We're going to make up something that it is. We're going we're gonna to get, we brought him back to her. And finally, the doctor, after seeing us multiple times, because we're new, we're parents and we want him to be perfect and we don't want any harm to come his way. And we're deathly afraid that we messed up. And the doctor said, look, you only have two choices. You can either be God or you can trust God. Those are our only choices. See, the flip side of idolatry is sometimes we make idols out of our kids, moms and dads. Sometimes we invite the devil to our table by saying everything is about our kids. I have to make them happy. I have to prevent any harm from coming their way. I have to make sure they never walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And yet the good shepherd says, you're going to walk there, but you're not going to have to be afraid there because you're going to get to know me as your God, not your mom and your dad as your God. We make idols of our kids or of ourselves by the way we parent sometimes. We cannot parent as if this life is the only life. And we've got to be self-controlled and we've got to abandon the outcomes and futures of our kids to God's hands, not our hands. Um, here's the fourth thing. Um, this, is, this is true in my life. I lack self-control when I don't give money back to God. So many times I think my, all of my money is for me and from me. The Bible tells us when Jesus is teaching a parable about soil, which is our hearts, and seed taking root or not taking root, maybe being choked out. The seed is God's word. He tells us that some of the seed got choked out. It never took root because the soil was deceived by the riches of, uh, in, of wealth. Wealth is deceitful. Sometimes the, de the devil just uses a tiny little tactic to just, just say like, that, that's for you, you deserve this. That's, that's from you, it's all for you. And God wants our heart to be open to receive his word. Some of us, we're not hearing the voice of God because we're holding on to our money as if it's all ours. I'm not saying this because our budget is behind. Our church budget is doing great. I'm saying this because my job as a shepherd here is to tend to your heart and to my heart. And generosity is a self-control thing. Contentment is a self-control thing. Proverbs 3, we love the part about trusting God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. And we love the promise that he'll make our paths straight. You know, just a couple of verses down, the Bible tells us to honor God with our wealth and then our barns will be full. If we want order in our life and in future generations uh, that, that are represented and connected to our life, we've got to be willing to live according to God's order, not the way of the world's order. Giving is a self-control thing. Generosity is a self-control thing. God asks for 10%, a tithe, the first 10%. So we can see really what the good shepherd is like. So you can really see what it's like to not want and to be at peace and to have the enemy not at our table, but just near our table. There's a big difference between near and at. And the more these things build up in our lives, the more we take this red chair and invite it and say, you know what? I actually think you should sit here. Why don't you just, why don't you just talk louder? And I will, I'll, I'll forget about all those other people in the meal and I'll just, I'll just focus in. And, and Romans 12 tells us not to be transformed or to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, to not conform to the pattern of the world. The devil's trying to tell us what normal looks like according to the world. The good shepherd is saying this world is not normal. It's time to uninvite him. It's time to push back the darkness. 
It's time to ask and grow in self-control. Here's the fourth one, fifth one, excuse me. I, I lack self-control in my life when I repeat lies about myself, my identity to myself. When I say out loud, I'll never get it right. No one ever accepts me. I'm always a mess. All my life's just a dumpster fire and it always has been. I'm not lovable. I'm so insignificant compared to everybody else. The more we speak anything that has to do with being unlovable about ourselves to ourselves, the more we are inviting that red chair to get closer and closer and closer to our hearts. You know, a lot of times we think the lies about our identities that we're not worthy, that we're insignificant, that everything is out of control and it's all because of us. It's just something, a mess about us in comparison to everyone else. The, the more we speak that, see, it doesn't get power from other people who say it to us. We think it's because of my coach in eighth grade who said this about me. Or we think it's because of that girl who, when she broke up with me, she said this and it's, it's always bothered me. It's not that they said it, it's that we kept repeating it. See, living in God's will, self-control means renouncing those lies and an ending of the repetition of those lies. Someone once told me, Dave, you are too smart to be doing what you do at a church. And his words had no power over me. You know where they got life breathed into them? Is when I kept meditating on them by asking and wondering and repeating it and saying it, and then saying it again. And I started to wonder, God, did you really call me? Am I really supposed to be in ministry? Is there, is there more? Is there, is, there, is there something else? Am I? Some of us, we've been repeating lies about ourselves to ourselves for years. And the devil has us distracted and divided. And here's the biggest one, so discouraged. Jesus died for all of us. Your identity is that you are loved, that you are worth it to him. And anything that we repeat about ourselves to ourselves that's different from that needs to be renounced and never repeated again. Amen. That's what self-control looks like. That's what takes this chair and says, get out of here. I've had enough. Proverbs tells us that this, when a man or a woman lacks self-control, they're like a city with their walls destroyed and the enemy can come right in and do whatever they want. The enemy can have a field day and a seat at their table. Are there, are there any of us here that lack self-control and want to have God lead us by his spirit to grow in self-control? Just raise your hand right now. I want to pray for us. Let's do it. I'm going to pray right now. God, thank you so much for your word, for your spirit, for the fact that we don't have to be dominated by our flesh, that we get to be led by your spirit that you breathed into us. So Jesus, would you show us right now? Would you heal us? Would you point us in a new direction? We want to walk by your spirit, not by our flesh. And we want to enjoy that meal, not with the enemy at our table, but just with him near our table, but, but, but listening more to the good shepherd not the accuser of our souls. So God, will you show us where we lack self-control and will you help us grow more in alignment with your word? Father, we abandon all those things to you. And we ask you to do what you do best, to heal, to restore, to transform, to make new. I pray this all in the strong and beautiful and powerful and resurrected from the dead name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Love y'all.